Hello, this is Kenna Tex here again with the second part of a series of videos about installing and maintaining a Gen 2 Linux system. Uh, this session, what we plan to do is to get um, uh, X Windows GUI up and running and a browser. So in the same way that I did in the LFS video, we can um, carry on installing application software within solely within the um, virtual machine i.e. the box that we're building the system on um, without having to rely on an external system and as before it's purely to allow um, copy and pasting um, which is much less error prone than typing in commands of course if if you didn't have this facility or you just wanted to go straight for the virtual you know work on the um, system that you're building then you could quite easily read um, the actions from one terminal and type them in on, on the machine that you're building um, and so the, the only reason I'm doing it this way is just to reduce the potential for errors so what I'm going to do first of all is take a copy of the system as it was from last time because it's a very basic Gen 2 system. It has a user, an unordinary user, which we can use for everyday stuff, network network connectivity and so on. So it's a good starting point for other projects. So to do that, I'll just right click the virtual machine and do a clone. And I'll give it a new name, uh, Gen 2 Basic System and just click next accept the full option of a full clone and hit the clone button and it'll just take a minute or so to uh, copy Okay, that's done. And just to make this virtual machine a bit more descriptive, I'm just going to change the name of that one. Uh, in fact, let's change it to install demo. Okay, so I'll start by booting this system. Okay, you can see that I've still got the zoom on from last time to 125%, so the font's a little bit bigger than it would be, but um, I'll leave it like that for the time being. So I'll just log in, make sure everything's as it appears to be, or should be. So that looks okay. Um, See how much space we've got, 40 gigs free, so that's fine. Um, got some swap there, 16 gigabytes, so it all looks good. So what I should do is, I'll leave that running there because I'll log out actually. Because what we're going to do is we're going to log in remotely. So to do that, just do SSH and the IP address. Okay, now why isn't that logging in? I typed in the wrong IP address. I have config or check 921680224. Oh, right, okay, it's come up, it took its time. Not sure why that was. So let's just log out of this again. So. Let's just double check. Yeah, we've got 40 gigs. So we're in. We're into the new Gen 2 system. You can see that's the host name there, where it says Gen 2 login. Gen 2 is the host name, and this part of the prompt is the host name as well. Okay, so now I'm going to get up a browser, and what I need to do is to search for um, Gen 2 X Windows. 
for some guides on how to install X Windows. So the one you want is this XOR guide. So what I should do is open that one up. And there's also another guide to read alongside it, which it refers to here, this link here on the first sentence. So I'm going to open that up in a, another tab. And what we'll probably have to do is just go down these uh, in tandem. There's not a lot on this page, but there's some useful information on this page about X Windows, just general information. This XOR guide is a specific um, guide to installing the XOR package. So let's first of all become the root user as we're going to do most of the stuff as root. And the first thing we should do is if we go to the X server one, um, you'll see what well, it refers back to the XOR guide for details of the installation. Um, the first thing it actually says is that we need an X flag to be set because it enables support for X in other packages. So it may be a case that by installing X here, not only only will it pull in um, uh, other, pa uh, or sorry, not only will it pull in packages for X, it will pull in um, or, or reconfigure packages that exist possibly on the system that have an X flag that has not currently been enabled. So let's edit the make file. Right, OK, so I haven't got Vim installed. I'm going to install that now, actually, because um, what might happen is I'll be in Nano and I'll be trying to do Vim commands in Nano and I'm likely to start putting in characters in places which I don't want to do. So I'm going to straight away merge. Well, I'll show you something. If I try to merge Vi, do AV for ask and verbose jobs equals six for the number of calls we've got. It will complain that it can't find Vi and it will try and suggest some packages it think that I might mean, but it hasn't in this case suggested the one that I I actually want. Um, normally it's quite good. It's probably because it's uh, only a few characters. It's it's probably a bit bit difficult for it to to find or to guess what I need. So there you go, it's, there's the Vim package that I've requested to be installed. It's in bright green, if you remember I said in the last video that bright green means it's going to be added to the world set, um, which means it will never be deleted unless we delete this package manually. All the other ones are dependencies and they're in dark green, so if at any point any of these dependencies doesn't have another application requiring it, a depth clean will actually clear up that, that file. So let's install this. Uh, you might have noticed that Vim itself has got uh, a use flag of X and it's minus X at the moment because we haven't specified it. So when we do come around to adding that X flag to the make.conf file, when we do an update, this change will be detected and Vim will actually be reinstalled to allow Vim to have um, access to the X window system or abilities for the X window system. Of course, if I decided I didn't want Vim to have that facility, I could add an entry into the package.use file and just put minus X against a Vim entry, app editors Vim space minus X in that package.use file and that would still mean that X is enabled globally so every other package would have that X flag enabled um, but Vim because it's got that minus X and it's a finer grain tuning it will take precedence over the global tuning. So it'll just give us a few minutes to install these packages. And it's probably worth mentioning there's no hard and fast rule for how you install and activate these um, extra use flags. Basically you can install all your packages and then go back and tune your flags that you want to enable, which means you're, you'll be rebuilding things. Or you can add these um, 
use flags in as you go along. So for example, I could have added X in now and then built Vim. And it would have meant that Vim would only have been built once, but it means potentially longer build in that more packages would need to have been built um, in, in one go because the X flag is being enabled. Um, it's kind of kind of six of one and half a dozen the other. Go, going along and doing the flags as, as you build up is probably going to be quicker because there's fewer chances of um, having packages being rebuilt. But it's it's probably a lot more work, I think. It's probably easy to get the packages you know you want and then go back and review um, which which use flags you want to get enabled. Uh, and talking of which, I'll just get a uh, tab up with the uh, Gen 2 use index up as well, just for reference, because it's uh, always useful to have this when you're installing. Just have this on standby. Okay, so that's now installed Vim. So I can now use Vi to edit the make.conf file. So because uh, this is just habit, it's probably a good recommendation to keep all your use flags in alphabetical order. And more so, they're in actually the ASCII order which means that all capital letters have precedence over um, lowercase letters because the capital letters uh, appear in the ASCII table before uh, lowercase letters do. They have a higher number. So this means counterintuitively, if I press insert, X goes right at the beginning of the list because it's actually a flag um, in a capital letter, capital X. So if I put that in there, and save and what I need to do now is to do an update but I'm going to modify the usual um, update command that's given by Gen2 it's just one I use personally to try and capture just about every eventuality um, which you might want to use or you might want to create your own one or just go with the default Gen2 one So these flags here, update, captures any updates. If we if we have synced, it would um, capture those changes from the sync, from the, the new repository. New use is any new use flags that have been enabled. Change use is any uh, use flags that have been altered or changed. Deep, I think, does a deeper search. Uh, with BDEPs, uh, I can't exactly remember what this is for, but it's something to do with... Um, Binary dependencies, I think. Let's get a new tab up and do man emerge. Oops. Right. It says in dependency calculations, pull in the build time dependencies that are not strictly required. It's automatically enabled for installation actions. Default to yes for depth clean action. Since many users of binary packages do not want necessary build time dependencies installed, this option is not automatically enabled for installation actions when use package option is enabled. So it's kind of something that Um, I've, I've, I think I've probably used it because I found it's useful in the past um, and just stuck with it. And it could be a case I don't really need it all the time, but I've just got used to using it. Uh, minus AV for ask and verbose. So 
because uh, I use them all the time, I don't normally type them in. But if you wish, it could be typed as minus minus ask and minus minus verbose. But as I say, I just normally use minus AV because I use them quite a lot elsewhere. And then minus minus jobs equals six. The number of calls we've got available, and we've got to tell Emerge what we want to update. And it's the world. Um, the world set which obviously includes the system set as well which is from the profile right what have I spelled wrong there oh, with B depths I've got the S as you can see Emerge has got quite a few options very very powerful um, program so just by adding in th that one use flag, we're pulling in 27 packages, 22 of them are new, and five are being reinstalled due to the X flag already being uh, a flag that was disabled on the existing packages. So Groff, that would have been uh, a package that came down with the stage three tarball, as was OpenSSH. Same with PSMISC and FreeType. And all the others are new ones, which are um, basically dependencies for the X flag. They they enable that they're, they're required because we've enabled the X flag. So these packages now need X flag support, and that's what all these libraries are, uh, are providing. So we'll just wait a few minutes for those libraries to install. They're they're not too big, so it'll only take a few minutes.
Okay, so that's finished updating. Let's just do a quick depth clean. Make sure that hasn't made any other packages. Alright, okay, so not sure why it wants to delete nano. Maybe because I've installed Vim. Um, which reminds me I'd need to update the editor variable. If I do um if I display the uh, editor variable it will be currently set to uh, nano. Uh, so any any application that uses an ed editor would still uh, fire off nano which again is not what I want. So what we need to do is if we have a look at eSelect options there's a an editor option there to change the default editor. Uh, and we can list, set and show and there's an update option as well if it's unset or invalid which it isn't so we don't need to do that so if we do show it's not set to anything at the moment actually so it is unset interestingly um, that means if we do list it won't have a default next, next to any of them no there's no star so let's try doing an update see what happens there so it's set it by default to nano. It somehow worked out that's the best one to do. You see it's now got a star next to it, but I don't want that. I want vi, so I need to do set three. And now it's telling me that I need to source etc profile, and this will be to update the editor uh, variable. If I do echo dollar editor again, it will still be set to uh, nano, but by running the profile, resourcing the profile, this will now have updated to VI. There you go. So I'll just do a list again. Let's do a show. Yep. It's telling us it's going to that program in user bin VI. And list, we've got the blue star next to it as well. So, um, it's strange because I always used to delete Nano once I'd installed Vim because I thought I didn't need to, but I've read recently that shouldn't delete it because it's part of the system profile. It's a little um, sort of tiny editor that's uh, useful if you need sort of system recovery mode or anything like that. But it appears there's nothing I can do that I could I could probably protect that to stop it being deleted. But like I say, I just I just never use it. Um, so I'm going to let that delete now anyway, rather than doing any fancy stuff to try and protect it. And we've got two other packages here which are not required, Metalog and Autoconf Archive. So it could be something we've updated or the fact that we've added this X flag in means that the, the way the programs are run or what their requirements, requirements are has changed. So. Uh, that's why these are now no longer required, the dependencies are not required by any other package. So we can just go ahead and say yes to remove these. Okay, so that's all clean now. So if we go back here, the next bit it talks about is XOR driver. So if we just quickly go back to the XOR tab, um, this introductions worth reading to if, if you need to know more about X windows and uh, why we use Xorg and so on um, right now this goes into some requirements for the kernel I don't think we did everything we needed in the previous video so I don't think there'll be anything to change here but let's just be safe and double check so I'll go into the sources in user source Linux and run the command make menu config. So I'll we'll check that fdev is in the kernel for the event interface. So it's under device drivers, input, device support, and event interface is there and it's already set. So that's fine. Then we need to make sure we've got kernel mode setting. As it says, most, most open source drivers rely on kernel mode setting, um, including the guest editions, which we will be installing. Um, 
Although it's strange actually because, well, when we're on Linux from scratch, there was a virtual box option which it tries to uh, enable when you start up um, Xorg. But it ignored it because it, it, A, it's out of date. It's like there's only one version of it ever been written and it's never been updated. And it actually uses the mode setting driver anyway in the end. But when we install the guest editions on Gen 2, it actually installs that uh, VBox driver, which is quite interesting. Um, so I'm not sure if it does use it in Gen 2 or not, but we'll just uh, make sure these options are available anyway, and uh, we can guarantee it will work then. So we'll start back in device drivers at the top again. This time we need to go to graphic support, which is one page down, and then another half page or so down. Graphic support, frame buffer, buffer devices we want to look for next, which is near the bottom of the first page. Support for frame buffer devices is already force enabled because we've got two little dashes next to the star. Um, and then it says to disable all drivers, including VGA, etc. Um, except for EFI based frame buff support only if you're using UEFI well, we're not using that so we can disable that but if you look at all these hardware drivers which is everything below this bit here you can see they're all uh, uh, unchecked anyway simple frame buffer support that was a requirement if you remember in the previous video we um, went through some recommendations from a Gen 2 page and that was one of the ones that it recommended setting so we'll leave that one and if we go back up to console display driver support, we're down here now. And then going to that, we need something called frame buffer console support, which is again already forced uh, active. So that's all we need to do there. The remaining sections are if you're installing this on a physical machine, you've got an NVIDIA card, you need to set this. If you want to use the Nuvo driver, that is. Um, if you want to use the actual NVIDIA drivers, then you'd, you'd need to read up on them how that works. Um, Intel cards there's, uh, or Intel graphics chipsets, there's a separate article there. If you're using AMD settings, there's more information there on the kernel, so obviously we don't use that. So we'll just skip past all this, to, all to do with that. So then we come back to the make config, which ties up with what we were looking at in the X server. So what I'll just do is come out of this, there's no changes to be made. So it shouldn't prompt us to save, which it hasn't done. Um, so we need to set two variables. X Windows needs a minimum, an input and an output. The input is the input devices variable, and the output is the video cards variable that needs to be set. Now, as I say, the guest editions which we're going to install uh, provide the video driver so unusually we don't set anything in video cards if if you're installing this on a physical machine you must set something in video cards you've, you've got to tell gen 2 what video drive you want installed to allow x windows to work but as i say this is an exception uh, because we're installing it as part of the guest editions it installs its own video driver so let's modify the make config again So let's put it down here. We do I for insert, just copy this video cards variable here. And I'm just going to put an empty variable there. Like I say, if you're installing a video, uh, sorry, if you're installing on a physical machine, you must put something in here. This is just an exception because we're using um, VirtualBox. And then input drivers or sorry, input devices. Again, if we copy this variable without the leading space, put an equals. Here, the recommended is uh, lib input, uh, as it's got here. So I'm just going to put that in there. There are other options which will probably work, like you could put keyboard and mouse in. Uh, FDEV might work as well, but let's use the default. It's, uh, it should should work fine. So let's save that now. And then it says to um, run a pretend 
emerge on the XORG drivers. We don't actually emerge XORG drivers because it will get pulled in by something higher up, which is actually the XORG uh, server itself. Um, you can see here it's actually being installed because it will it will use this, but it's not being put into the world set. But you can see that the drivers, the only driver is installing is the lib input because we've not specified a video driver. And there's all these other additional X libraries that uh, will be installed to support what we've required. Also importantly, as the X server page mentions, Mesa is needed. So that's being picked up automatically as well. I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the previous video, but the the way you use the world set is that you only install packages you definitely know you need. So we could install XORG drivers and put it into the world like like the pretend emerge has done here. But we're going to install X server as well. And in fact, I'm going to install the XORG meta package. And that would mean that we've got X XORG drivers and XORG servers in the world set unnecessarily because this meta package will pick, pick up these two anyway. And the reason why you want as few items in the world set as possible is that when you're updating, sometimes you can get problems with dependencies where you've got a certain package uh, that's been pulled in uh, because of the world set and it wants to either delete that or update it and it can't do because it's in the world set. Um, and you get all sorts of problems and it's just easier just to keep the minimal uh, minimal amount in, in the world set as you can. So uh, normally when I do a an install on a real machine I find that XORG server is adequate but as it says here there's also XORG X11 meta package which pulls in basically everything it's additional fonts utilities XORG server, server the drivers um, XORG drivers as well as the drivers themselves uh, now I did that when I was testing this and I didn't have any problems I've redone that and I, I uh, when I was starting to record this these uh, sessions and I did get a problem I found it was fixed by installing XORG server uh, sorry XORG 11 x11 the meta package so i'm going to install the meta package again and hope that they will will have fixed it i don't know why it didn't work with just the xorg server but again it's something because of the fact that um in a virtual environment it seemed to be that the problem uh was being caused by the virtual environment so if you are installing on a physical machine xorg server should be enough to um to get the X windows running, but so I'm going to install the XORG X11 uh, package to pull in everything, as it seems to be a bit more reliable under the uh, under the virtual environment. So I'll just switch back to the XORG just to check there's nothing else to be done. Now it's saying to install the XORG X server here, so I'm going to do that. But like I said, I'm not going to install the server. I'm going to install a, the wider, the larger uh, meta package, which is XORG X11. So XORG X11. Minus AV for ask and verbose and tell it I want to run six parallel jobs when it's compiling. So again, I'm just going to go back and check what's going to be pulled in. So there's a load of new packages here. You can see they're all, a lot of these are part of the meta package, these little apps. They're not normally installed with the server because they're not normally required. Um, so if, if you have gone for the X server, don't be worried if you see fewer packages being installed. All these fonts, I believe, are, or most of them are installed as part of the meta package. Um, in fact, I've just seen something else that we should add to the make.config. If you followed the Linux from scratch installation, you may remember LVM required uh, some information about the graphics cards you're using. Um, I believe it may use the graphics card for some 
uh, computational stuff. Um, and these are the defaults that it's picked up. Uh, we don't actually need two of them. The x86 is false because it's got brackets around it. And that's obviously because of the architecture we're using, which is Intel architecture. The BPF is used, I can't remember why, but I seem to remember in Linux from scratch, that's a requirement. But the MVPTX is for NVIDIA cards and the AMD GPU is for AMD graphics cards. So um, we've got neither of those. So I'm going to alter this uh, variable, or in fact, add this variable to the make.conf and uh, just add in BPF and x86 because they're the only two that are required. But if you have, for example, NVIDIA, you'll want to add in BPF, NVPTX and x86. And likewise, if you've got an AMD GPU on a, on a real machine, you'll want AMD GPU, BPF and x86. There's no point in, in uh, specifying additional stuff we don't need. So I'm going to do notice this question. Just edit the make conf again and add in that variable. I'm going to leave in the x86, remove the NVIDIA option and remove the AMD option and put the double quote on the end. So that means that when we rerun that update command, I don't know if we'll get fewer packages or not. We may do, or it may just know we haven't. So it's just functionality that's uh, not being enabled. I'll find where it went to. Yep, there it is. So you can see just by specifying that that variable, it's picked up the two uh, use flags that we've we've entered in there. So you can see they're all brand new uh, packages that are being installed. You'll notice that although we added xorg, so if I go back to the command I put in. I did AV, I didn't do a one shot with the one AV or the dash dash one shot. I said to emerge, I want to install this package and add it to the world set with that command. But despite that, Xorg is not in bright green. And the reason being, there's a problem with this install. It says that we need to, you know, basically approve these licenses. So what I need to do, as, as before, as I said in the previous video, I don't normally let this um, uh, I don't normally let Emerge add to the config files automatically because it puts all this information as comments and I find it just uh, creates too much too much sort of uh, white noise basically around the stuff that's really important to me. Um, I do sometimes if I'm trying to track down a problem but normally I don't so I'm going to add these manually. So I need to modify the package dot license and it's media fonts so just so I know where to put this keep everything in alphabetical order it's a lot easier to find stuff media fonts there it is just delete the version number save that and we'll copy the other one as well and add that in and I'll put that next to it because it's part of the same uh, package group if you like so group them together and save that. So now if I rerun the emerge command yep you'll see now now xorg's gone to greens to show that it will add it to the world set. You'll also notice the input devices is detected lib input which we've added. You can see there's other if you've got a laptop you'll probably want the Synaptics um, use flag as well but uh, lib input generally is, is sufficient. Okay, so I think that's ready to go. It'll probably take 20 minutes, half an hour to install this. It's uh, Some of these later packages are quite a bit bigger, so they will take a little bit of time to install. So I'll start that off and let that run.
Okay, so that has built all of the uh, programs and libraries required for X Windows. Um, we've got lots of output, a lot of these are repeated though. Um, got things like optional recommend, or well, not recommendations even, but just options. So, for example, you can install this beaker package for caching support. Um, so what I'm going to do is get another uh, window open, move it to the left here and just do stuff in this window. Um, let's log in first. And become root. Uh, just so we can uh, uh, act on the messages that are here. So caching always seems to be a good idea so why don't, why don't we install that uh, a little time in this okay that looks like that'll just go in like that Okay, so then we've got uh, a font that's been added, and we can use the font config option of eselect um, to list and enable disable fonts. And the reason why that's not set or uh, unset, I think it is, is because normally with set it's just one option out of many, whereas the font config um, it's a list of options that we can enable or disable individually. So you can see this is 60 liberation.conf, and there's that file there, or that, yeah, that file there. So to enable that, we just type in eselect font config, enable, and then the number in square brackets next to that line, so 28. And if we list uh, the font config eselect again, you can see that liberation.conf has now got a star next to it, meaning that that font configuration is enabled. Then it's got some messages that repeat for different font packages that have been installed saying to run exit FP rehash if you're using non-font config applications. So I think this will fail because we're not in a yeah, we're not in a uh, X Windows environment, so that's something we can do later on. So just scroll down, all of these are all the same, so I'm assuming that one command will cater for all these fonts. I'm not sure if we've got any non-config applications but it's um, something that can be run. Um, then there's some information about font config being displayed here um, and some information about optional packages for LLVM so because I'm not using that directly I'm not going to install these options because um, you know, it's not something I'll, I'll be using directly. Uh, and then we've got some messages saying for the meta package that there's some X cursors that have been installed and that any other cursor set should be placed in that directory. Uh, some more information about cursors um, and some information here about configuring Xorg. Although it's non specific, it's just general Xorg rather than Gen 2 specific. So I think that will do for this window for the moment. So the next thing we've got to do is env update, which will load, reload the uh, libraries and the cat library cache that is, and then source etc. Profile to ensure that any um, environment variables are updated. And it says stuff to do there for Nvidia. Um, and as it says here, X server should run out of the box. Uh, some information about configuring. Which we'll just skip, skip past. Now it says try to start X to start up the X server. Well, it will fail because we haven't got a 
video driver um, but can show that failing So if I type star text to start the next window, as you can see it's failed and the error it's got, it says there are no screens found. So it basically can't find a video driver. So what we've got to do now is to emerge the guest editions which will install the video driver for us as well as other stuff. So do emerge, um, I think it's virtual box guest editions okay so you can see this is pulling a load of other stuff as well and there's the package we've requested to install and add to the world set and you can see it also has an X flag which is obviously now being detected because it's in the make.conf so let's get that lot installed you'll notice also that docbook XML here there's two different versions being installed in parallel on, on the system at the same time and that's what this S is indicating that they're in different slots and that's what the number is in between the package name and version and the repository is 4.4 so that's slot 4.4 and this second one is slot 4.2 and the slotting is, is a way of allowing different versions of the same package to be to coexist on the same system so obviously there's different features from that same package but different versions that are required by some or other of these um, packages and also you can see the video driver that's being um, or will be installed which is the VBOX video driver so as I say unlike well, it seems that unlike uh, Linux from scratch where we didn't need the VBOX video driver, it seems that the way Gen 2 has been configured that um, it is required. Having said that, it may just need to be installed and it's never used. It may just use the default mode setting driver, but um, you know, if we really need to know about that, we can look at the Xorg um, log file to see which video driver it is actually picking up when it's starting up when we run StarTex. So just a couple more minutes while the last few package packages installed. VirtualBox guest editions takes two or three minutes to install. So I'll just wait for that now.
Okay, so now we've got the VirtualBox guest editions installed, so I'm just going to, uh, yeah, I won't bother opening another window. I just need to read the um, messages that have come from some of the packages we've installed again. So this is just telling us about some applications requiring a session bus. It's not actually saying that we need to do anything. Um, so VirtualBox guest editions. Please add users to VBOX guest group so they can benefit from seamless mode, auto resize and clipboard. So there is something we need to add the um, user to uh, the video group. So we can use this command here to do that. So add kernel text to the video group. That's done, and also now add it to the VBox guest group. Okay, there's a VBox SF group for shared folders. Not going to bother with that because of no need for it. But obviously, if you are building this system for um, a, a working system, you may find that useful um, in a virtual environment. Um, now I've got to add VirtualBox guest editions to the default run level. So if we do RC update, we can see the VirtualBox editions is not there, guest editions is not there. So we need to add this. So do RC update, add VirtualBox guest editions, and we add it to the default run level. So that will be started next time we reboot and we should really start it now as well just for completeness so that looks like that's worked okay um, to use the VirtualBox X drive use the following file as your X11 XOR conf uh, when I was testing this I found that um, I didn't need to use this it seemed to work automatically so I won't do that unless there are problems with the um, actual video driver which I'm, I'm not expecting also, also you make sure that you use Mesa library for OpenGL so e select OpenGL so let's see what we can do with that, we can list, set and do a few other things as well so let's list what targets there are, there's X or, or get X11 already set but there's no harm in just rerunning this set command to ensure that that is actually yeah it's the same it's actually set as we would expect it to be there's a desktop dot desktop file has been installed to start vbox client and desktop sessions and it shows us how to mount shared folders had we um, activated or enabled the vbox sf group and it just reminds us that this is purely for if we're running gen 2 inside a vir virtual box machine as a guest which is what we're doing if this were the host then there would be no need for this package whatsoever um, just go back to the XOR guide. So it says about testing here. Um, it will fail. Uh, will it fail actually? Um, I think what I'll do is I'll come out of this and reboot the machine because um, I want to make sure those modules have been loaded correctly. They probably have, but. Um, Oh, there's one missing actually, but looks of it. There should be three modules there, so I will in fact reboot. And what we should notice is that when it reboots, the um, driver should hopefully pick up and the, the console will be resized, and it, it has actually done that, so that's good. So I'm going to resize this back to 100%, otherwise we'll end up with a screen that's too big for the monitor. So logging back into the virtual machine, if I do a mod now, you can see there's four, uh, three uh, modules loaded, which is correct. So I'm going to try StarTex. I wouldn't expect anything to work 100% because there's no applications to load. But you see we've got a black screen there, which is quite promising. Um, 
it's there's a warning there and an error could not resolve key sim one brightness sign I'm not sure about that um, XBK comp are not faithful to the X server so I'm not sure if that's part of that error or not but it's missing these applications here which are the applications we used on the Linux from scratch video which uh, is to provide a basic window manager TWM and an X ter or three X terms and an X clock as well so if we go back to um, the XOR guide you can see that here it recommends installing TWM and X term so that we can test it properly so I'll go back to my uh, SSH window here and log back in remotely become root and I'm going to emerge these two now so it's TWM and Xterm you can install Xclock if you want to complete this but I'm just going by the instructions here Okay, so there's four packages to install. Okay, that's done so let's go back to the virtual machine and try and run StarTex again see what we get okay that looks quite good so the only problem is now this is it wasn't full screen uh, so it's tried to squeeze in these windows in within this space it had so I'm gonna if you remember before from LFS if you if you've watched that you remember that the first uh, window is the um, login window so if I do control D on that one it will close the session down whereas if I do control D on the other ones it will just quit those sessions so if I do control D on that one and it closes down so I'm going to go full screen with this window now now if I type start X okay still this may be the problem I had with Linux from scratch where an initial yeah, initial video mode just doesn't seem to reset the display properly to the full screen. Whereas rerunning, um, uh, rerunning the StarTex does reset the display correctly. So that's what happened there. So if I come out again, it should it should work again. It does. So that's that's looking promising. So I'm going to minimise this for the moment and just check to see if there's anything else I need to do I don't think so because it seems to be working fine alright um, oh okay there's something about the keyboard so if you want X to use an international keyboard create the appropriate file so let's this is probably the only edit you really want with the um, Xorg the, the the idea is that you don't um, create a config file unless you absolutely have to and this is an example you to to, to do this you need to um, to, to get the right keyboard layout you do need to actually create a config file otherwise you'll be stuck with the default US one if you're not in the US so if I actually go back to the virtual machine you see if I press my hash key I don't get a hash I'll get a backslash if I press my double quotes key I don't get a double quotes I'll get a, an at sign so that shows that the keyboard is is the US so I need to copy let's copy this all of this and just um, change 
change this to, I think it needs to be GB for me. Um, don't know what model keyboard is. So I'll delete that. I'm not sure if I need these. Variant sounds like a good idea. It is a QWERTY keyboard. Not sure what that option does, so let's try that. Oops. Um, so I'll go back to the virtual box, shut the server down, restart it. Let's type the at, it's working correctly, and the shift to, which is quotes, and that's working correctly now. And as a final test, I can have the pound sign as well, which is on my three key. So that's all okay. Uh, let's minimize that again. And there's a couple of other pages to look at if you want to look about Wayland, which is supposedly the next windowing protocol for Linux and something about security with X there as well. I'll just check there's nothing else on the server page. And that looks like that's all there is to it as well. So that's the GUI part of it. So the next bit I'm going to do is to get a browser just so we can use a browser within the GUI and then we can um, dispense with uh, accessing uh, the virtual machine from a, an external um, SSH session. We can do everything from within the virtual machine. So I'm going to install Firefox. Um, so that package is just called Firefox. Usual command to install a new package. And what I'm going to do is just see what this comes up with because I might make some uh, changes to the use flags depending on what comes up. Well, it's forcing us to make some actually. Um, it's saying that these packages must have these use flags enabled to, to allow them to be installed. So again, because there's these blockers, you notice that the package we've asked to install and add to the world set actually is is uh, not in bright green showing it won't be added you can see there's a whole host of other packages here that will be installed so we need to add these to the package.use as I say you can do yes there and it'll, they'll be added in automatically but you get all the comments and Although it says required by Firefox, yes it is required by Firefox, but other packages may well require it, so it's kind of a little bit misleading, that comment, if you were to see it later on in the future. So package.use. Let's paste that in. So the first one is media libs. Oh, one other thing worth checking is some of these might be global um, use flags, in which case you'd you'd want to put them in the make.conf. So, if we go to the use flag in, index, control F to find the first one APNG, and that's actually come up with a package name. So we know that's not a global one because all the global flags are at the top of this file. The other one SQ Light. Uh, right, okay, that is at the top. It's carried on the search from the beginning, isn't it? Let's click here and do another search. Yeah, there you go. These are all the global use flags. So really, I would say SQLite should go into the make.conf unless you have a reason not to, not to do it like that. So I'll get rid of this. Just leave that one in there. Save that. Edit the make.conf now. And add in SQLite. Keeping it in alphabetical order as before. So let's rerun that emerge command, see what that produces. 
it could be there's other packages going to get pulled in because of these changes and they might need more configuration but that's not the case in this situation so let's have a quick look okay right I've just noticed there's this CPU flags which we haven't set um, it's defaulted to what is pretty standard on most modern um, 686 class processors um, the original 686 wouldn't have I don't think that has SSC too it, it might have SSC I can't remember it's um, I don't think it even had MMX actually the Pentium Pro uh, so this would only be for fairly recent say core or Pentium 4 processors would have these features but the processor I'm using that's made visible through the virtual machine has got most of these options here so before we install uh, Firefox I'm going to do a no there and install the package that we couldn't install when we were setting up because it wasn't avail available and it's called CPU ID to uh, what's it called CPU ID to CPU flags I think it is And what this does, it interrogates the processor and gives us the correct setting for that uh, CPU flags variable. Yeah, this is the package we want, so let's install that. It's only a tiny package. In fact, I'm feeling it's a script. Okay, that's it. All we need to do is run this package. CPU ID to CPU flags. And there you go, it's telling us this variable needs to be set to include all of these options so let's go back to make.conf and we can now actually remove that comment and insert those flags uh, oh I've done that in the wrong place let's do insert that's better so now if I save that we run Firefox Um, you'll see somewhere, where was it? Yeah, there it is for FFmpeg. You'll see all of these optimizations uh, are activated. So that means FFmpeg will be built with these optimizations, which will mean faster encoding or decoding, um, whatever it actually does. Now, there's one other thing I've noticed that we should really set up, which is localization. See this L. I, uh, L10N localization variable has not got any configuration at all. Um, now I have a feeling the default is EN and EN is not there but that's the default. Uh, let's see if this is... I'm not sure if it's in one of these. No, it's not. I thought it was off one of the. There was a link somewhere here. It might be this make.conf link. Yeah, it is. Yeah, this this is quite a good page. This is about the make.conf. It tells you all the variables that make.conf understands. Um, things like this C flags and CSX flags, which we've already set, um, as well as the others uh, that uh, can be set and what they do. Features, yeah features is quite a good one to have actually. Let me look at my own one. Let's see if we can add any extras in here that are quite useful. Um, right well, uh, yes features, yes that's right. Um, stick this down here features is good for a couple of options that are available um, called parallel fetch and user fetch and basically parallel fetch means that the packages can be fetched in parallel 
and user fetch means that the user is allowed to fetch packages if it if it runs the merge command it won't be allowed to install or compile or anything but um, it, it could be useful to to run so I'm going to add them in and what else have we got yeah merge default options I don't use this but if you find for example you continually typing in some of the switches then you can put them in here and they automatically get added to the emerge command every time you run it um, I think I've not used it because it can vary somewhat so I'd rather have more control over um, what what happens when I run emerge uh, this port portage tempter that could be quite useful you could make that point to a, um, for example an SSD drive or some you know temporary FS drive which is actually in memory to speed up um, compilation or as it suggests here if you use Ccache uh, it could be quite useful this uh, that's where all the packages that are downloads get stored um, I'll make uh, or I'll uh, yeah I will be making another video which will go a little bit into that um, I'll explain that in, in the future video how that can be used you quite useful um, in fact I think these are yeah they're all set to defaults anyway these these next few that are mentioned use we know accept license well there's a separate license now license config so may as well just use that um, this linguas the linguas is not actually used anymore it's uh, I'm not sh quite sure why this is in here it's obviously not been updated but uh, I don't think there's any package that uses this linguas environment variable it's just this oh right that's probably why there's a warning here it causes packages to implicitly skip locales right it's used by some get test based build systems okay um, so I don't think I've come across that being used in anything I've been installed recently so we could set it see if it does catch anything um, so what we want here is EN for English so that would be US English so that's a catch-all if we haven't got a, a localized I a GB for me or you know it could be French German wherever uh, if there's no specific package at least it will default back to the EN and I'll put my specific one here which is EN underscore GB and that's slightly different from the LION variable which is the one that's used generally by packages now again I put an EN but the localized one uses a, uh, a hyphen instead of an underscore um, and some more, more information shows what it should be for Portuguese and oh yeah th th yeah this is the bit that's saying that LION variable is replacing the linguas so some I, I'm not sure maybe, maybe it has replaced it in all but these get text packages possibly but there'd be no harm to leave it there if uh, if it does actually pick something up but as I say in my um, working machines I've, I've actually now removed that that linguas it's um, it doesn't seem to cause any problems um, one other one which I don't think I've seen mentioned here Oh, this is the linguist, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go further down. Yeah, there's the L10N. And it shows, let's say, what, what's required. Video cards, we've already got. As I say, normally you'd put something in there. In this situation, we don't need to. Yeah, it's, there's one missing for sound cards. Um, well, specifically Ralph's the sound cards which is ALSA underscore cards and you specify the, the particular driver I, I believe there is a Gen 2 wiki page for that you can search for it um, in fact I will search for it now because I'm not sure what it would be for the for 
for the AC97 Intel driver we've got. It'll be this one. Right, what we can do is let's close that, save that. We can do a merge minus minus info and for example grep uh, alsa oh, but I bet it's going to pick up what we just put in actually so it'll come up blank won't it yeah let's room that out and restart that yeah that's better so this shows when, when you haven't set the ALSA cards it's enabling every single um, option it's got for you know the the, the type of hardware it recognises. So I'm not actually sure which we'd need for the AC97 because normally I use the HDA Intel, but we've not set that one. So it could be something like this Intel 8x0. Could be the one. Let's try typing that in. Okay, this is for specific. Um, this is for specific machine to look to it. So I'm going to look for virtual box Elsa. See what happens with this one. Elsa cards. No, it doesn't look like this is helping much. Well, anyway, if it's not set, then by default it's going to use all of them, so it should, in theory, work. Although, as I said before, um, you wouldn't hear any uh, sound because the sound is going to come through my headphones. But that, that that is one that would normally need to be set. So I'll just leave that there in there, roomed out. Uh, right. Just quit that. So what I should do now is just run the update command to see if any of the changes I've made actually affect anything. Uh, yeah, that one there. Okay, so the changes are due to the um, make.conf and the package.conf. So that was a package, uh, sorry, package.use change. That was a CPU flag change. That SQLite is obviously a dependency because we've specified SQLite as a use flag in the um, make.conf. And the last one, again, is an optimization for the CPU architecture that we're using. So I could actually run this, just to make sure the system's sane, because I might get distracted, go away, uh, and come back and forget that I've made some changes without updating the system. So this is the right thing to do, rather than just go ahead and uh, install Firefox, which is what the original intention was. But because these changes have been made for Firefox, it would just so happen that the uh, installation of Firefox would pick up all these uh, packages that have appeared here. But this is the correct thing to do. Make a change and do an emerge uh, update to check that those changes, see whether they've affected any packages or not. And one thing I'll do after this also is to do a deck clean to see uh, if anything needs to be uninstalled as a result of the changes as well after the updates have been installed.
Okay, so that has updated. Um, just do the emerge depth clean. So it's not found anything. Just want to have another look at the um, make.conf because there's a couple of other use flags I want to um, put in here to ensure that certain uh, things don't get activated. Um, so the first one's bin dist. I want to make sure that's deactivated. I'll show you what these flags are here. The flag to enable disable options for pre-built packages. I'm not sure what GRP is due to licensing issues. So I don't want any binary packages installed in the system. I want everything to be built from source, basically. Uh, the next one is I'm going to deactivate GNOME. So I don't want anything GNOME or related to GNOME, uh, unless they're libraries, for example. Um, but I don't want any uh, like GNOME desktop type stuff installed. Um, another one is libav, which uh, conflicts with ffmpeg, so I want to remove that as well. And I think that should be it. So I'll save that, just check there's no more updates again. So say every change you need to check for updates. Otherwise, you could end up with a broken system and you get all sorts of problems happening and likely you'll need help from the forums. Okay, so there's no, no changes there at the moment, so that's fine. So I think we're probably in a position to go for a Firefox install now. So let's just review what's going to be installed again. So there's lots of stuff here in this FFmpeg which you could enable now. Um, a lot of these are global variables, for example, MP3, OpenAL, they're global use variables. But it would entail more packages being installed, and I'm not going to do that at this point. Uh, um, I've decided I'm going to install my packages. Um, and if there's anything else I want to turn on, then I'll do that afterwards and just allow the um, uh, packages to be rebuilt. So although it will take a little bit longer, it just, just keep, means I can keep focused on, on the task in hand, which is installing these packages. So let's just look rest. See the, so there's a localization. The EN's been picked up, but there is no ENGB. Um, but although I believe the Hun spell, I seem to remember from Linux from scratch, EN included English and all the other variants of, of English, uh, GB English and so on, uh, in that package. So, yeah, there's quite a few packages being installed. And again, Firefox, that's got localizations for EN, GB being picked up as well in that L10N. Uh, environment variable. So I think good to go. Uh, this will take a good hour or more to install as I remember. Pro it's probably going to be a couple of hours being some recording this. Uh, it seems to take a lot longer when, when it's uh, being recorded. Uh, let's start this now.
Okay, so that's Firefox installed now. A few messages just to check over. Um, we've got one to install something called Events for Print Preview Functionality. Uh, that's quite a useful tool to have uh, views, PDFs, and so on. Um, also, it's suggesting we install it here for GTK2 as well. There's some information about CLang, Rust, and Firefox warnings about official branding. So, before we go any further, I'm going to install Vince. So that needs a few changes to um, uh, probably some of these I think are in the uh, main make.conf. So we'll just double check these. First one's Dbus. So just check. Yeah, Dbus is a global flag. Cairo, I think, is. Uh, yep, there it is there. And Python, I'm almost certain that one is as well. Yep, there it is. So, um, preferable to add them into make.conf, dbus Cairo, and Python. Dbus Cairo and Python. So this is going to trigger a lot more um, a lot more uh, packages that need to be installed. Um, well, with Vince is okay, but Perhaps what we should do next actually is um, check for what updates required. And you can see straight away up here we've got glib, we've got um, dbus, so that'll be reinstalled. Okay, we've got Firefox needs reinstalling unfortunately because of Dbus, as does Vim because of Python and quite a few others. So I'm going to let those run, so it's going to be another little while while Firefox rebuilds. And while that's running, I'll just check these news items that popped up. So I'm going to go into machine again. And the select news list to find which items have been added. Okay, so there's that use flag that I added in with a minus in front of it to make sure that um, it wasn't being used. Basically, they uh, identified there was a conflict, and I th as I remember, I think the default was to use libav, but they found that for whatever reason it was, I don't know why, they made mpeg the default ffmpeg. So I'll just um, read those two to deactivate them. Four and six. So you can read that in your own time if you so wish. So that should have removed them. So I'll just wait for this um, to rebuild and then I'll install events and then that should be it for this session.
Right, so that um, those updates have, um, have affected the packages have been reinstalled. I'm just going to do this depth clean as it suggests here at the bottom. Check there's nothing that's altered that has caused a dependency to become orphaned, and no, it hasn't. So now I'm going to emerge events. So we've got a few packages there. The use flags that were required, we've already made them, uh, installed them as global variables because that's that's primarily what they're used as. So this should be okay to install now.
Okay, so that's finished. Um, what I'm going to do now is go back to the um, virtual machine, start X up, and just test Firefox to start off with. Just type in Firefox. And if you've never used TWM before, basically you've got to position the window is shown as a wireframe, you just position it on the screen where you want it. And as you can see, as soon as you can left click, it runs the program in the position you've placed it. So that's Firefox running. Uh, some stuff about privacy on that tab. I'm just going to go to the settings. Um, Preferences. I just want to not so much worried about the privacy data for this demonstration, but um, it's more to do. as let's turn. So we'll try. Okay, um, it's to do with the. I'll make it the default browser, and I want to retain the tabs for the next time I load it. So with Firefox, if you want to get the menu up, we can just press Alt, and you can quit or use Control Q from that, and then show events. Again, you get the wireframe up for the window, and that's events running. Um, I wonder if I can actually find a PDF on the system to view. Um, Probably one somewhere. I would have thought there would be in the documentation. Yeah, there is. So let's go for the BZIP manual. Use a shared doc BZIP. Let's see if we can open that. So I want to go to. Uh, okay, well, let's go directly to root. There it is there. So user. Share doc bzip2 manual, and there you go, that's a PDF file that's being displayed there. And we can go, I thought there was a plus and a minus here, but there isn't. We should be able to scroll down. So that's those two uh, done. So that's the uh, end of this video. I uh, got as far as I wanted, which was to get Firefox up and running. Mainly, this events was just a uh, an extra, as it was uh, like a recommendation for the two GTK versions. In the next video, which will probably be the last of the video in the series, um, I'll install some actual useful applications uh, similar to what I did in the Linux from scratch video so that will be things like um, Thunderbird, the mail client, LibreOffice um, maybe a couple of other applications which I didn't install in Linux from scratch max runs and I will finish up with the um, Battle of West North game again just to show that again you know it's, it's the same software that's being installed on a, on a different um, flavor of Linux so, yep, that's it. Thank you very much for watching again, and goodbye.